I don't think me holding it the whole time is going to be <laughs> super helpful. All right, let's see if this will even hold. It's probably not going to. You know what? That's fine. We're going to go old school with this bad boy. I'm just going to pop it right up against all of my recording gear. There you go. Should actually work. There. I want. Oh no. I want to ask Let me about the recording. There we go. Oh, go ahead. I wanted to ask Go you about. The, I wanted to ask you about the recording process for Ember. Ember Go. How long did it take to put the material together, and how smoothly did it go for you this time? Mm. It was actually an interesting process because we were actually in the middle of lockdowns in Melbourne, and we all live in the same city, and so a lot of the writing was done through Zoom and Skype meetings, effectively, wow. and each person basically we, we locked off two days a week during lockdowns where we were like hey you know everyone do whatever you're doing and then maybe on like wednesday and sunday we do maybe four hours or something and just get all on a call together put our ideas out there and sort of see where things are at so basically we'd get together twice a week like that and bounce all of the ideas off each other during the week through whether it's you know uh, guitar pro like tabbed out stuff or quickly recorded riffs everyone would send it to me I'd put it together, do some pre-pro on it, and then we'd, you know, go through it all uh, during those sessions. So we actually did that for about, oh, it was a while. Uh, I want to say on and off, probably three months. And then when we had some sort of uh, brief period between some of the lockdowns we had, we caught up and, you know, really refined everything. And then when we were finally out of all the lockdowns and everyone was, everything was sort of back to our court, you can go do whatever. We booked in time with Thomas uh, Plek Johansson from Panic Room Studios. Uh, we've worked with him plenty of times before on mastering uh, and stuff like that. And he's just been a great mentor for so many years. And we were like, we, we really want his production uh, producer insights into this album. He's worked with us in the past, but not in that capacity. And we were like, we couldn't think of anyone else that we would want working on our stuff at this point. And so for about a week, most of the band lived at my house and what we were doing was effectively from about like 6 p.m. till midnight or 5 p.m. till midnight, something like that. I think it was like seven hours uh, for a whole, for like six days. We'd be on Zoom calls with Plek and he'd have the sessions loaded up. And, you know, we'd do all the ideas. He'd try different things, make suggestions. And then basically from 9 a.m. the next morning up until 5 again, we'd make all the changes and then, you know, go through the process wow. again every night. So it was, it was pretty insane. And I, I had no voice for the last two days because it was like, try this on vocals, try this, do this, change that part. And yeah, by the end of that and having no sleep, but pretty much at the end of that, we were ready to record the album. And that was, that was the writing, you know, writing pre-pro process for it. It's so different to anything we've ever done before, but it was honestly really fruitful. I think all the emotions that we had that we sort of put out, while we were writing it and not just sort of bottling it up until everything washed over was a really good thing, uh, not just for us as people, but obviously for the album. And I, I think the response so far is reflecting those emotions that we put into it, which is really good. And I wanted to ask you about the title track. Did the uh, title track come before the name of the album? Yes, uh, that was... That track was one of the first ones I wrote. That chorus, the 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 lyrics to the chorus is actually probably one of the first things I wrote for the album at all. Wow. I just sort of jotted it down and I had it in my head. And I just, as soon as I had that and that little guitar melody, that little, you know, do, 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 I sort of played that and I was like, that's, that's the bit, you know? And so that song came together very much around that chorus. And once the album was finished, when we were putting song titles together and the rest of it, uh, Amber Glow was really the one that I was pretty gun ho on because it really surmised the album, you know, like yes. it, it was all about, you know, the fire's still burning, even if it's just a little bit, you know, there's that little bit of hope, that little bit of chance and whatnot. And I think that sort of really, if anything, I think that title worked on its own, but then it really worked when we got the, artwork back from nicholas that's when yes. it was like oh this is ex this is so perfect and i wanted to ask you if you could clear things up and in the 
reading of the song and going through the video, I've heard so many interpretations of that song. I wanted to ask you, um, what were your thoughts in creating it? Mm, uh, it's, it's always one of those things where it's like everyone, and I feel the same obviously when I listen to music as well. I always have my own interpretation of what I'm hearing. And I think everyone's going to let that imprint them in, you know, whether it's something that they hear and go, oh, that reminds me of this thing that's happened to me or this feeling I had or something that's going on at the time. So I, I always kind of feel weird being like, this is what it was about. But I can say what, uh, you know, for me at the time, it was very much that that feeling of that sort of endless dark hole. You know, like sometimes when you feel like you're trying and people tell you it's going to be OK, it's always a lot easier to be external to the situation and see that it can be OK. But when you're in it, no amount of practicality is going to get you out of that. And so you do feel a lot of the time you're really just walking into an endless darkness, that endless path of like, I am trying, I am doing all the right things. But I'm still sort of there. And with that song, that chorus really does give you that sort of um, the hopefulness in the end of that chorus is that whole, I'll light my own way, I'll fight my own way through and light the path. You know, it's really that thing of mm. if I can't do it the way everyone else has, I'm just going to have to do it my own way. And that is different for everyone. Uh, sure. No matter what situation you're in, whether it's just, you know, whether in your just a tricky situation at work or a personal situation at home or you know for for that song specifically it was more of a depressive based um experience everyone's journey through a hard situation is different even if the outcome is things are better uh the way you get there is always different so for me sure. writing that was more about my experience of how i get through certain situations and times for myself and it's it, it always feels very against how everyone else tells me it's going to work out if that if that makes sense so yeah. that that was the sort of driving force behind the lyrics in that song and uh we had discussed what was going on with me and i've been going through a period of you know i was going into the doctor to get what was gonna be two months off for knee surgery turning into nine to twelve months of recovery oh, man. and uh you know i i just look at as Everything is like an opportunity. So I said, well, I will dive 100% into the, into the podcast during that time. And yeah, I'll well, pull up a flagpole yeah. and see who salutes it, you know. Dude, that's, and see, like, that's your journey, right? Like, you're like, I can't make this time frame shorter. Um, and as someone who's come off some physical injuries due to some sports stuff, it's like, okay, well, all, I always think of it as like, all you have is time. And if you're right. forced to have that time, you, you've got to choose what you do with it. And, and it was a lot like that, obviously, during the COVID stuff, you know, like, um, oh, yeah. again, being in Australia and the lockdown specifically in Melbourne because the outbreaks we had, it was like everyone was like, oh, this sucks. We're stuck at home. And, and they did. It's, it, it absolutely sucked. But at the same time, it's like, are you going to sit there and do nothing while you have that time or are you going to do something you know it could be anything you know origami whatever it might be a podcast whatever it might be you know you kind of have to build your own journey and obviously you've you've delved head into that and that, that's awesome that's like you, you could not do anything better than that sure another one of the tracks i wanted to speak to you about that i really enjoyed was tangle yeah i wanted to ask if you could speak on that track as well uh, probably not so much as Joao, our guitarist, uh, ex-guitarist, I should say, who wrote a lot of the lyrics. Uh, he and I share vo uh, lyric duties quite a lot. Uh, I think that was one of Joao's more visceral horror mm -hmm. style sort of tracks. Um, you know, the uh, the the all-imposing, you know, the, the way the song comes across and the way he sort of, uh, uh, I always like looked at it was like sort of like Swamp Thing from DC. Like it was always mm -hmm. like nature riding the ship no matter what like it was just that thing of humanity can do whatever it wants but at the end of the day nature owns this planet not us um and yes. you know that came if you, if you read just from the lyrical perspective it's very much a, a personified nature and, and, a, and a very um malevolent nature not a not a benevolent one so um yeah i i loved uh recording the vocals on that track because joao 
uh, sort of manned the desk for a lot of the vocal tracking for the album. And when we were doing it, a lot of it came down to what was the tone we wanted, you know, of the the main part of the vocals. You know, there's the bridge section of it that's a lot heavier. And then that, you know, that outro sort of or end section to the song, that real massive orchestral thing. But the lyrics are, you know, uh, will we ever be free? We've lost all our hope. Like, it's such a... Yeah, it's this big triumphant sounding ending, but the lyrics are pretty grim. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm very fond of that song for sure. And uh, I've seen footage of the band live, and it looks like an absolute amazing experience. One that I would love to see personally. Um, I wanted to ask you if you could speak to your fans about what could, they can expect at a live show. Yeah, I mean, for, for our live show. I think a lot of it switched again, unfortunately, just before that period where where things shut down for a while. I think after touring with bands like Trivium, Amonomath, uh, Insomnium, Winter Sun, just all these amazing bucket list bands of ours, you know, getting to see their live show and just realizing like we really had to step our game up. Like it's one thing to play a tight show and be fun, but putting on a spectacle like again, you go see like Behemoth or something. Yeah. And, you know, that's like the closest thing I've ever had to like a religious experience, you know, like seeing Behemoth. It was just the first time I saw them was incredible. And they've only ever become more and more into the theatrical side of things. Uh, Demi Borga was a, is a great example of that as well, who I, whom I love from that perspective. And we really just wanted to up our game. We, you know, we, uh, especially for this album, we went and redid all of our outfits and uniforms so to speak um we've got that sort of real ragged apocalyptic kind of thing going on we've got an entire light show that's pre-programmed to our click tracks that comes with us everywhere so regardless of what's going on on the house lights or our lighting guy we have sort of some individual tube lights that we've built ourselves and programmed and some smoke geysers and things that are all timed with the music and just all the things that go into making the show feel more interactive and not just watching five dudes on stage play some songs which is you know it's not a, there's nothing wrong with that it's just with the style of music we play and more of that symphonic element in parts and you know that i guess larger than life sound that we go for we want that to be reflected from what you're seeing and and the immersion that you're getting the the first chance we got to do that was a few months ago in japan you know before the album came out we sort of got to workshop it a little bit and with our new keyboardist as well and I think those were the best shows we've ever played. Everything just landed. You know, we've we've upped and even little things when you're playing live so that you can interact with the audience more. All of our patch changes on our guitar boards and stuff are all pre-programmed. We don't have to touch anything. And the reason That's for that great. is so that everyone can walk up to the front of the stage, you know, like actually interact with the crowd, make everyone feel like they're not just watching the band, they're a part of the experience. And that's always my favorite thing when I watch bands that I love. I always feel that way. You know, even if I'm at the back of the room, I feel like I could like reach out and, you know, touch sure. the band members. I, I don't think there's a better feeling than that. Uh, and and we, we're just trying our best to replicate that as much as we can, really. And we talked a little bit about it. I wanted to ask you if you could speak on the album artwork and the artists that did it. Um, yeah. Um, basically, I um, what was the idea behind the uh, the artwork that you see on the front cover. Absolutely. And, you know, f for me, the artwork is just one of my favorite things about the album. We had Nicholas Sundin, who was the guitarist in Dark Tranquility. And, uh, you know, he's done, he's just worked with an incredible amount of bands. So I'm not going to start listening to him, but, you know, he's, he's just done so many incredible things. And he worked with us on our third album, Pardon Vita Mortem. Uh, you know, it's a very abstract looking cover and it was an incredibly sort of intricate sort of thing he did for us because it was a concept album. And then after the last album, we sort of realized we wanted to go more down that route again, that more abstract, less brunt uh, force kind of thing where Where Your Sins was a very in your face cover. I mean, it literally is a face. Um, but we hit up Nicholas again and luckily he was stoked to work with us, which is great. And so we sort of gave him the overall ideas of the songs and lyrics to three songs. And I believe we sent Emberglow, We Were Kings, and possibly Marionette. Uh, he sent us a couple of bits of artwork back that we immediately thought were awesome. 
but they were completely different to what the artwork actually is. It was just a completely different piece. And he'd been working on those and was like, yeah, you know, here's, here's how I'm feeling. Let me know what you think. And sort of we, when we first got them, we looked at them and went, these are amazing, but they don't, they don't feel quite right for the album. And it was just so funny because we were like, oh, we'll just message him tomorrow because we're in no hurry. Like, you know, we'll let him know that we like the ideas, but, you know, maybe maybe try to just take the theme with what he has in a different direction. And like 2 a.m. that morning that all, that we were meant to reply to him, he sent us an email and I just I loved it because the email was just, hey, sorry, I I was feeling pretty creative and I was just listening to the lyrics again. Uh, I've tried one more thing. You might hate it, but I'm just going to send it out to you guys. It's pretty rough. Let me know what you think. And it was basically like 80 percent finished version of what you see on the album and like I, I i like literally teared up when i saw it like it was just i looked at it and just went that's the album like yeah it was right. just such a such a perfect moment like i just saw it and went that is if you condensed all those songs into just one thing that's what the artwork is mm -hmm. and i sent it to the band and i just said look you can disagree happy to take the arguments but as far as i'm concerned this is the album cover and everyone pretty much unanimously was like, that's the album cover. And it was just like, that was awesome because there was no real back and forth. He just tried this thing that came, you know, differently to him. He'd obviously put so much work in the other ones as well. But the fact that he'd sent it to us without us asking, I think that just showed how well it was going to mesh. Like he just did it when I think, you know, look, this is completely different, but let me know what you think. And it was perfect. So it's it it was you know honestly like an 80 percent 90 percent finished version of what you see on the finished cover it was just little tweaks that we requested more than anything i also wanted to speak to you about the journey of the band this band has endured so much through the years mm. and um i wanted to ask you if you could give me a brief uh summation from start to where you are now and all the things that have transgressed through time yeah i mean it always feels weird to say this because it's been like 15 plus years of being in the band but it feels like a third of that time because so much has happened you know uh and, and it's just weird to have that much sort of backlog in history to look back on uh you know we started out as effectively joao and i our original guitarist we were at university together and he showed me Dark Tranquility for the first time. And I was already into like In Flames and just a bunch of metal in general, you know, like a little bit of Arch Enemy, Trivium, Lamb of God, Metallica, all that sort of thing. Lots of power metal at the time. Um, but he showed me Monochromatic Stains. I remember that being the first Dark Tranquility song I ever heard. And that just changed my entire outlook on on writing music. And I just, I just, that band really... Um, yeah, and Children of Bodom, obviously being a massive one there, but but that that first moment here in Dark Tranquility was like a game changer for me, and right. I just fell in love with Mellow Death. You know, obviously Insomnium at the gates, every, you know, Insomnium Gatherum, all of it, and Joao and I just started jamming together. And my brother was playing in my old band at the time, and I was like, oh well, maybe maybe you can join in and have a muck around, you know, which he was happy to. Um, our keyboardist, Sasha, our first keyboardist was a good friend of mine and we'd never played together in a band. And so we were like, Hey, do you want to come muck around? Uh, Milky, our first bass player, he and I had run like a local community, uh, sort of like a government backed local community event, um, place. So basically it was like a council based event promoter and we'd put on like small gigs and stuff, which was great. But we again, never played in a band together. We just watched each other in other bands. And it was another opportunity where I was like, do you want to come and have a jam? You know, it's this kind of music, you know, whatever. And our first band prac, we were, we pretty much wrote our first ever song, Creative Alphalus, pretty much start to finish. Wow. And that, that was like the moment we all just went, oh, so we're a band. Like, you know, like it was like, we all got along so, so well. Um, Sasha left just before the release of Bleed the Way, uh, she had a lot of sort of agoraphobia and personal stuff going on that made it really difficult for her to go out and play gigs. Uh, and that was, you know, that was a really like respectful um, sort of separation. You know, she's still one of our best friends. And Kez joined the band at that point and, and was in the band until only just last year. 
that short ago yeah um and so then we went into the basically touring mode we had our first opportunities to tour australia with them on a math which was again just absolute game changer stuff like oh, touring with a band that big um and honestly a lot of it just goes on that route of like lots of touring meeting genuinely just meeting a lot of our music idols and realizing they're all not only incredible musicians but just wonderful people and i think that that interaction with all those people and like all the fans just meeting people across the years is probably the biggest influence of what has happened with the band um i think all the any successes we've had being able to go overseas and headline shows uh is supporting bands like um insomnium omnium gatherum scar symmetry all those sort of thing overseas and here all of it has just come from the fact that we've genuinely not only enjoyed each other's company for so long but meeting all these people getting along with these people and just you know we're really taking in how important that aspect of music is that's why we you know like i think as metalheads we enjoy the music but when we realize there are other people like us that's what sure. gets us into the scene right so when you start writing music and you, you sort of lose that magic of the writing side, you know, like you realize what it actually is to be in a band. And that is a little less fun because, you know, there's just so much business side to it. But the one thing you never, ever stop enjoying is meeting people. I think that in and of itself was probably the biggest driving force behind this band and still is. And, you know, I was saying we just went to Japan a few months ago for my brother and i our drummer it was our second time over we were just keen to see people we've already met and meet new people but we had three new members since before covid so we've sure. got you know new guitarist again who was a close friend of ours already same with our bass player and keyboardist even just watching them for the first time being overseas as a band um and just seeing their faces light up when they got to meet people after the show who obviously were just like oh my god you guys are amazing and all that stuff I, f I felt like it was day one of the band mm. by watching them have that experience. Sure. Um, so I feel like the only way to talk about the timeline of this band really is through the connections and people we've met. I genuinely feel like that is the, the, the most important part of where that journey has been. And it's gotten us all the way to, I guess, where we are now, where we've been cemented quite a while in the music scene, the, the melodic death metal, I guess, world. And I think this album, if anything, cements that a little bit further in those elements. But I think it's also a very different sounding album that really carves our own spot. I think this is the album where we get to say this is what Orpheus Omega is and no one else gets to do that. So I think that was a that's a very fulfilling thing to sort of not only know for yourself, but to see that that's the reaction it seems to be getting as well. I think that's great. And then, you know, 15 years into this into this band and feeling more creative than ever I, I i couldn't ask for more i think any of us could i think the male community is the the tightest community of all genres mm. um yeah i remember i grew up in the 80s and i remember we would just pass cassettes pass them along yeah go to go to a record store and just rumble through bands and go hey these guys look like a bunch of rockers let's pick this up and see <laughs> you know and uh you know that's the way it was and then if you came across one that's really great you shared it with all your friends you know you yeah copy. yeah the community was just very strong and still is today um mm. i think uh i think I tell a lot of people if you're feeling down and you're feeling upset and you're not feeling in a good place Go to a show, see someone with a shirt. Yeah. That you say, hey, I like that band too. And you yeah. have an instant friend. I think, and you're you're a hundred percent right, you know. And I think the other side is you know that feeling you get where you you know, you say you see someone with a shirt that you also like or that you're wearing, and then you obviously start talking to that person because that's what you do. And then the next step is when then you start showing each other bands that you've never heard. Sure. And then like the journey starts again with a new person. And I it's, I think that, you know, obviously different genres will have that, but I just don't think any other genre quite has it in a way that like you just make lifelong friends in the metal scene because of sure. music, because of it's just incredible. And I'm still friends with people I know 20 years on who I barely talk to, 
you know, just, they're not in my like that that family friendship circle. But anytime I'm at a gig, they're like my favorite person to see at a show. Sure. And and you know, that's I think that's insane. I, I love it. I also wanted to ask you about your musical development. At what age did you begin? So I started playing guitar properly at like 15. So like in high school during um, music class and whatnot. And I got sort of back into it. I played acoustic. I learned acoustic a little bit when I was younger, but I didn't really gel with it. I didn't feel anything. Um, I played keyboard for a few years. So I got pretty decent at that. And then same sort of thing. I just felt like sitting behind a keyboard. It just wasn't for me. And so I got into more sport and stuff in early in high school, just sort of, you know, sort of took my time up a bit more with some soccer and stuff like that. And then at in um, music class with my closest mates, because we all wanted to play different instruments, we just ended up in a, started writing some stuff together. You know, we all got into Metallica, but we also really like a lot of rock stuff. Like, you know, I, I grew up with lots of like Midnight Oil and In Excess and stuff like that because mm-hmm. of my dad. Sure. And then my mom's a massive disco head. So like my sensibility when it comes to like vocals and melodies and stuff does not come from metal. And then when I, you know, was more in my teens, as you do, you discover metal and then it, something happens in your brain and then you just go, what the hell is that? I need that all the time. Right. (laughs) And, and then that's, you know, I I was playing a lot of rock stuff on guitar, but then as soon as, and I, I remember my, our sound guy, who's still our sound guy and he's my best friend since high school. Um, I remember he came over to my house when I finally got like decent internet and he downloaded Metallica's wherever I may room because he had gotten into it. And he's like, Oh, I, I just want to chuck, I want to chuck this on for you and just, you know, let me know what you think. And that first part of that song where it just does it and everything kicks yeah. in. I, that was my moment. That was like the precise moment where my head was just like, what the hell is this? Um, and so, yeah, uh, from there, it was just wanting to learn all of that. You know, how the hell do you palm mute? You know, how the hell do you do those speedy runs? How do you, you know, how do you use a wire properly? Um, and all the fun stuff. And then by being in other bands and whatnot, vocals sort of became a necessity more than anything. I was backup vocalist in my old band. And then when we started Orpheus, we just didn't have anyone else to do it. And so because I could already kind of do vocals, everyone was just kind of like, oh, I guess you can do vocals, you know, be like Alexi from Children yeah. of Bodom, you know, like, um, which, you know, I don't think anyone really realizes how hard that is because, you know, there was only one person like him who could do that. So a bit ambitious on our end, but that sort of pushed me in that direction. Then, you know, a few albums in, I really, really started taking the vocals super seriously. So I think from the third album, I that's where my split went from being a guitarist and a vocalist. Um, and that's that, you know, I, I, I hope it's noticeable on the album. Like if you know much about like writing guitar parts and vocals, a lot of the time people will write vocals to suit what they're going to play on guitar, like to make it, not just to make it easier, but like, it's just patternistic. I, I basically put the guitar down entirely when I started writing vocals for this album. I was like, all right, guitar is done. We're not thinking about how hard right. this is going to play to life. I don't even care how it's going to translate because at that point I didn't even think about it, but I really wanted to just put my best foot forward as a vocalist. And I think it translates, but at least for me, it was yes. so nice to just ignore any thoughts of guitars and stuff. You know, that was, that was really cool. And, and what is next for the band? What can fans look for next? I hope, well, in the immediate future, there's still so much more cool content from Emberglow that we have to release. Like, uh, there's some awesome behind the scenes stuff. There's a fair few more video clips and some really cool things that I'm looking forward to getting around to. Uh, Hoping, hoping that we can announce a national tour soon. Uh, It is quite difficult getting tours together at the moment. I'm sure everyone knows that feeling. Um, but hopefully next year we'd love to go over to Europe. That's sort of the biggest short-term goal. And then hopefully over to North America after that, that would be that would be the sequence we'd love to follow. And just, you know, putting things forward with promoters and bookers to see how possible that is. Because that's, you know, we I, I think this is easily our best album. It's the album oh, we've put absolutely. the most effort into. <laughs> Um, and like, you know, we want to be able to tour on that. We want to be able to tour on it properly. We want to be able to put on the best show we can every night. And so 
that means touring. Uh, and so that's the that's the biggest goal. So there's definitely a lot more stuff coming out that we have. And yeah, I'm just keen to sort of, you know, slowly put it out so people can just actually sit with it and enjoy it. Same reason we did a vinyl for this album as well. I like the idea of when music comes out, I want to be able to chew on it, take my time sure. with it. So same thing goes with the release. You know, some bands will just put an album out and then, you know, that's it. They just kind of, it's there and then they'll go play shows and then that's it. Whereas for us, it's like, no, the album, the album didn't come out of nowhere and just exist. There's so much stuff right. that came with it. And we, we want to be able to share all those really cool things. Um, like I said, behind the scenes, documentary stuff, um, some really cool playthrough videos and how to's on some of the cool sections of some of the songs, just all the fun stuff that people might miss when they're listening to it because you know you're you're listening to the songs you're listening to the meaning but sometimes it's kind of ni- nice to know what the ingredients were that went into it too i think that's always fun absolutely and uh speaking of the album and a vinyl version what is the best way to get the album a merchandise that the band has absolutely uh if you want to grab one of the very limited vinyls I-, I believe there is still a little bit left you can grab them from the anti-vinyl vinyl club's website if you want to grab some CDs and merch, our official store is still the best place. And I think still the cheapest shipping to get it from. So OrpheusOfficial.com is your best chance. And lastly, I wanted to ask you, if you could give a message to your fans, what would that message be? Uh, it's always going to be the same message since day one. Uh, thank you. Because the the thing that has a band going from the garage to a stage is wanting to play to people. And I I genuinely could not imagine writing this sort of music and not being able to go and meet new people and play for new people and, you know, just play to fans of metal. That is the biggest part of it. So thank you to anyone who's ever seen us, who's taken even 30 seconds to check out a snippet of our music. That is genuinely the biggest reward we could ever get from it. Well, I wanted to take you take a moment to thank you personally for creating an album that I enjoyed from top to bottom. I do feel it is your strongest work to date and that great things lie ahead for you. And I wish you all the best. I'd love to see you here in the States. Uh, we, we really appreciate it. And hopefully we will be able to play in front of you live in, you know, hopefully the near nearer future, nearer than further. Well, thanks again, my friend. And you have a great rest of your afternoon, my friend. Thank you, dude. You have a great day, okay? All right, cheers.